And our speaker today is Professor Dean Ambar. Professor Ambar teaches courses in American politics on the American presidency and governorship, race in America, American political development, and polit political parties and elections. He is the author of How Governors Built the Modern American Presidency, which is now available through Amazon.com. Today, Professor Ambar will provide commentary on the current political climate and what direction he sees this election taking. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ambar. Good afternoon. There you go. Forecasting the 2012 presidential election, uh, change or continuity. I have to say, uh, this, uh, this May 18th moment we're experiencing uh, right now, uh, I think is, uh, has to be one of the most boring moments in American, uh, recent American political history with respect to uh, presidential forecasting. In other words, if I had told you two years ago that you know, sometime in the spring of 2012, Mitt Romney would be the Republican nominee, you would have said, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, if I'd have told you that uh, President Obama would be struggling to get the country out of uh, uh, the worst recession since the Great Depression, and maybe there would be some moderate economic growth, you'd say, yeah, yeah sure, yeah. Uh, if I were to tell you that uh, uh, right now that uh, he is uh, ahead uh, in the real clear politics poll of polls, which is, I guess, the equivalent of, I don't know, the holiest of holies in uh, political science, um, by maybe, you know, 1.8%, 2%, you'd say, yeah, 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 sure, it's about right. There is absolutely nothing really um, unusual or striking about where we stand today in terms of the horse race uh, with regard to uh, the presidency and, and, and what we're looking at. So um, having said that, I've thought long and hard about culling some uh, nuggets that may be interesting to you about this race. Um, what kind of election are we looking at? I want to talk to you a little bit about that from my perspective because I think um, sometimes uh, because we're in a um, highly saturated media culture, we tend to think about uh, the presidential election in terms of the horse race and also cultural issues. This week uh, began with a discussion of uh, gay marriage, which we'll talk a little bit about, and it recently has ended uh, with a discussion of uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, uh, President Obama's former pastor, and the invocation again of race uh, into uh, uh, the presidential election. And all of those are more or less interesting kinds of things to talk about, but um, uh, recently I've been reminded of what the general manager for the Oakland A's, Billy Bean, uh, used to uh, admonish himself not to do, which was to actually watch his team play baseball. <laughs> In other words, uh, he thought that the more he watched his players, the more ignorant he became. That at the end of the day, analysis, facts, data, uh, were to rule uh, the decision-making process, his expectations. You know, you get, you get to watching a guy and you say, boy, oh, what a hell of a guy. He's, look at him hustle out there. And you know, you, you look at your pitcher and you say, boy, he's really struggling, he's scuffling, hey, he's got the win. And you start to fantasize about things uh, that you'd like to see than, uh, than are really there. And I think that happens with us sometimes as citizens, certain times with professors and uh, we get caught up in the um, dynamics rather than the data, and I have some data for us to look at. So uh, whether it's gay marriage, whether, which I don't think, uh, in case you're wondering, will be um, a particularly salient issue for voters come November, uh, or whether we're looking at the issue of race, I don't think we're going to discover anything uh, unusual uh, about Barack Obama's racial background or exploits, or he had some white girlfriends in uh, in New York City. Okay, I you know they they were compressed. I learned I think they, there were so many that they had to be compressed um, in his biography. I, I don't know what we're going to learn new uh, about any of these cultural issues, um, and I do think they tend to be distractions more than anything else. So, what kind of election are we looking at? What are the fundamentals? This is an incumbent election, right? No surprise there. Why is that important in my estimation? Well, numbers say that of the last 10 uh, elections featuring an incumbent, uh, incumbents have won seven of those 10 times. And if you look at who um, won those elections, you take uh, Bill Clinton in 1992 defeating George Herbert Walker Bush, 
Uh, even that had some unusual elements to it, um, perhaps the most unusual element being the presence of Ross Perot, who gained 19% of the vote. Uh, I do not know if uh, Bill Clinton would have lost that election had Perot not been uh, involved in that race, but I think it's pretty evident that the entire dynamic of that race would have changed. It's not a very uh, common circumstance in American politics, that kind of incumbent election, but he was uh, successful in unseating a sitting president. That's a rare thing. 1980, Reagan uh, upsets, and uh, by many people, uh, people's estimations upsets and defeats uh, the sitting president, Jimmy Carter. Uh, and that election broke in the last two or three weeks uh, of the campaign towards Reagan. Um, in May of that year, no one necessarily knew that Reagan or believed uh, fully that Reagan was going to win that election and it turned out to be a pretty convincing victory. That is probably the best scenario for uh, the last 10 elections for someone, an outsider, um, to defeat a sitting president. If you go back to um, the other example of Carter versus Ford, Ford was not a true incumbent. I guess the, the point is that it's pretty damn hard to beat a sitting president for lots of reasons. Maybe we can talk about that, uh, which I think explains why, in my estimation, this is probably the weakest uh, field of Republican candidates I've seen um, uh, in a long time. And I think it's because uh, governors like Haley Barber, uh, Chris Christie, Mitch Daniels, and others um, made, the, uh, made, made the choice, made uh, the guess, the gamble, that this was going to be a particularly difficult time to, upseat, uh, to unseat uh, a sitting president. They'd, they'd be best uh, to hold off until 2016. So I think that's the fun, first fundamental that we have to think about. This is an incumbent election, and Obama, I think, uh, has a better than even chance entering it just on that basis alone. This is an election that's going to be driven and is being driven, I think, um, in a basic way by the status of the American economy. Uh, it is an economy that is moderately growing. Uh, we can put in any adjective that we like, anemically growing. Uh, pathetically growing. Uh, we, you know, even Mitt Romney has acknowledged that it's growing, but it's not growing fast enough, right? Uh, I raise it because um, however we categorize the growth, um, it's still very difficult to defeat presidents when there's any kind of economic growth taking place, and I'll look at the, we'll look at the chart and, and explore that. Whether it's in GDP or unemployment, uh, the stock market, certainly in terms of jobs, which I think has proven to be uh, the most fundamental variable in thinking about um, presidential elections. We have high unemployment, 8.1% today. It's likely to be anywhere from, I don't know if you're feeling good about things, 7.7 .7 to maybe 8.2. It's going to be about where it is now, maybe a little lower, perhaps a little higher, who knows. Um, but it's not going to um, radically alter, uh, in my view. And, and I'm no economist. I have the grades from my undergraduate experience to prove that. So. Um, I, we could talk after about that if you want to lament. Um, the, the real question, or one of the real questions about the state of the economy is uh, to break it down in terms of swing state um, economics. What is the status of the economy in places like Virginia? What is it like in places like Nevada? Two very different kinds of economies. Uh, Barack Obama's counting on Nevada. The economy there has been pretty awful. Uh, he's counting on Florida. It's been uh, slightly better, but still not so great. Uh, but it's been going so well in Ohio relative to the rest of the country that the Republican governor there has been recently claiming lots of credit for it. Um, the question is, will voters give the governor of Ohio, the Republican sitting governor of Ohio, the credit for that growth, or will uh, they give the credit to uh, the federal, the national policies of Barack Obama? That remains to be seen. But looking at the internals, uh, the, the internal situation of the various states, the swing states, the so-called purple states, I think is going to be really important. Um, and then lastly, in terms of what kind of election we're looking at, we're looking at what has been typical of the last uh, several cycles, probably over the last 25 years, which is uh, an election marked by a deeply divided electorate, uh, that there is really uh, very little wiggle room uh, to siphon off those people who are independents. Uh, this will be an election likely decided by independents in swing states, but also the enthusiasm of voters um, on the left and on the right for their candidate. So I have my clicker. Let's see. How many political scientists does it take? Well, don't laugh now. 
Ah, if you press the arrow. Uh, um, here is, I don't know if you can read that, we're looking at the morality of gay and lesbian relations. I just put this up there because this is how the week began. When I began my week thinking about this talk, this was the issue. And depending on whom you talk to, um, this was either the death knell for Obama, right, the gay halo on uh, the cover of Newsweek that was going to frighten um, any number of exurban women in Missouri or Ohio. Um, um, or uh, maybe it would create such enthusiasm among young voters that Obama now had um, done what was necessary for his base, and this was going to be a net positive. But if you look at this, uh, what you find is that over the last 10 or 11 years that um, gay marriage has become, and gay and lesbian relations rather, have become uh, more morally acceptable uh, to the electorate. Uh, and I don't think that's surprising. Demographically, we know that that's generally how uh, things work. But along with that acceptability or increased tolerance or uh, value for the acceptability of gay and lesbian relations, we can see that um, there is also the idea that the support for gay marriage follows with that. And you'll note there's an interesting dip uh, in the decline of uh, support for same-sex marriages right around when the economy begins to tank. Um, and I'm not a sociologist or a psychologist, but I would say that there's probably something there, there. Uh, nevertheless, we see that support for gay marriage has generally tracked over the last 10, 12 years with an increased support for the acceptability of gay and lesbian relations. I put these here because I think, while this doesn't tell the whole tale about whether or not um, this issue uh, will dominate the electoral uh, cycle and discourse or even matter to voters, I do think uh, it suggests that Obama and his staff, uh, perhaps uh, Joe Biden notwithstanding, believe that it was going to be uh, an appropriate tipping point in time to come out in support of gay marriage. Would they have liked to have done it in Charlotte? Most likely, but um, Joe Biden is a man of many mysteries and uh, blessings or curses, depending on how you, I like Joe Biden actually, but I mean, you know, he. he He's going to do what he wants to do. Um, payroll job growth, approval ratings, and popular vote margin. Um, I think that this is not, again, definitive, but, and the numbers per se are not so important, except to look at someone like Eisenhower. I mean, here's the way to think about this chart, at least I do. It takes someone like Eisenhower to win over a not particularly great candidate in Adlai Stevenson, although I happen to love Adlai Stevenson. He was an awful candidate um, in many ways, and he was going against you know, the savior of the free world, um, Dwight Eisenhower. Even if you're Eisenhower, you're losing 0.3% uh, uh, in terms of uh, net payrolls, uh, and only gaining a meager 62,000 monthly jobs. Uh, only if you're Eisenhower can you pull off that kind of 15-point uh, popular vote uh, victory margin. Almost everyone else with that kind of anemic job growth, look at Ford in 76, uh, finds themselves losing uh, or scuffling, if you will, um, in the general election. I think this is, uh, incidentally, the gay marriage um, Data comes from Gallup. Uh, these figures come from Nate Silver of 538. Um, this gold bar here representing 125,000 net jobs growth uh, for Silver, and I think he's probably on to something, um, represents a kind of tipping point by which the electorate historically has uh, generally uh, re-elected or elected uh, uh, a president. Um, for a sitting president, you're looking at, and he's arguing for Obama, uh, anywhere under 125,000 jobs per month in terms of growth is, is a real danger point. Uh, and that's about what uh, the economy gained last month. And so it puts him right on the edge. Of course, he had, and the country had been gaining upwards of 200,000 plus jobs prior to that. And if you go down to the 200s, you begin to see uh, the forecasting suggests that we're looking at upwards of 70 or 80% chances for Obama as an incumbent to be re-elected. Um, so the Thursday uh, payroll numbers, 
uh, that come out, you know, if you're listening to Bro Bloomberg Radio on the way uh, to work or uh, the monthly job figures that come out the first Friday of the month, those are much more likely to play a role in deciding the election as opposed to whether or not, uh, I don't know, Obama flinches on the view or gets into a spat with uh, that Hasselback person, right? I mean, that's more than likely to uh, be at what's at stake here. Um, perhaps we can talk about the electoral map later. It's not interactive uh, at this point, but um, this is what, uh, if you're Mitt Romney and his team, you're looking at overcoming. Um, just as a reminder, you need 270 electoral votes uh, to be elected president. Uh, Obama won 365, so the question is where does Mitt Romney peel off these particular um, states? And I think it's, it's worth thinking about because, um, you know, if, if for example, if I can, you know, think, if we're thinking about predicting, and I will, I guess, um, momentarily, if we're thinking about the swing states that uh, Obama won uh, in 2008, if we, let's say, give Mitt Romney Indiana, which he's well ahead of the polls in Indiana, and there's really no good reason why um, McCain lost Indiana uh, in, in 2008. And he lost by a very small margin, but um, that is a true, was a true anomaly. Um, let's give Obama, uh, or rather, let's give Romney Indiana. Let's give him uh, North Carolina, where he is up even now by the slightest of margins, very slightly, in the polling that's been done there. And we could dismiss the polling, but let's just, we're here, right? What the hell are you here for if we don't want to have fun with this, right? I mean, come on. So <laughs> uh, let's give him North Carolina. Uh, let's give him Florida. Let's give him Ohio, too. Uh, and let's give him Virginia. Can we give all of those to Romney and say he turns over that, that, those blue states from 2008 and they turn red? Uh, he still loses the election. He still loses the, it's that daunting a task based on the electoral college mathematics, based on the electoral map itself. Uh, he, Obama would still have 272 electoral votes, even if you peeled away Indiana, which is going to happen, Virginia. I think absolutely Obama will win Virginia, North Carolina, I don't think he will. Florida and Ohio, uh, I, I think that's probably, uh, likely to be a split, um, but um, I would anticipate, if I had to pick one, I would say I, I think Obama's likely to win Ohio. Uh, but we could talk about why or why not later. I think the point is, uh, this is why Chris Christie and any number of would-be presidential candidates said, um, I think I'll, I'll have the next election. I think it's just that daunting a task to not only go over to go over uh, and defeat a an, uh, sitting incumbent president, but to go ahead and um, turn the map back, particularly uh, with the demographic changes that have been taking place, which I will allude to right now. Um, you probably woke up like I did, I don't know, yesterday to the New York Times headline that for the first time in American history, uh, the minority population births um, outnumbered that of whites. And I think if I listened to my uh, computer loudly enough, I could hear dun, 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 you know, playing in the background. <laughs> and I, you know, it was very ominous, you know. Um, but I think the, the point is for Republicans, and, and the Pew Research said this best, that 93% of the population growth in 2010 to 2011 came from so-called minority populations. Uh, for Republicans, for the future of the Republican Party, which is, uh, if I can sort of introduce a kind of conclusion here a little bit, uh, I do think that we're looking at um, the future of the Republican Party being at stake if it is unable to tap into uh, the Latino population as a source for, um, for, voter, for voting growth on a national level. Doesn't mean um, Republicans can't win you know, statewide or um, congressional races or even presidential races. But if you're planning out 20, 30, 40 years into the future, um, there's just absolutely no way you can look at uh, anything near a kind of competitive um, set of presidential races, races in the future with um, 
the Latino population or Hispanics voting um, in the manner they did in 2008 or they are projected to vote now uh, for Democrats. There's just no, absolutely no way for that to happen. And, I, and, and in that regard, I think one of the issues in terms of why this election matters is um, what it means for the future of the Republican Party. I do think Mitt Romney um, is not a candidate that um, most, uh, and perhaps I'll hear from some of you, most um, deeply convicted uh, Republican voters um, are in love with. You ask yourself, who is the McCain voter? The military people, right? Um, people, you know, country first, that, that banner. Um, who, who were the supporters of Ronald Reagan? Well, you know, just, you know, traditional conservatives, anti uh, or small government conservatives, you know, um, uh, the silent majority holdovers from Nixon, those who were uh, faith-based. We can talk about any number of Republicans who won. Indeed, George W. Bush gained those folks as well as some of the Latino population that Romney is not currently able to get or is getting at the moment. Who, are, who is the Mitt Romney voter? I mean, who wakes up? There you are. I want to hear from you, sir, because... Sure, we can do that. Um, I do think that um, the Mitt Romney voter is a different kind of character than, you know, oh, I don't know, the Haley Barber voter or someone that was, you know, people that were feeling great about, you know, Chris Christie or any of the other candidates I mentioned or would-be candidates that I mentioned. Mitt Romney is essentially a pro-business, small government Republican, and there are some of them out there, but they're not as enthusiastic as the core or base of the Republican Party, which tends to vote uh, more in line with uh, cultural issues uh, at, at bottom. Um, let me click here. Here is, um, and I'll try to read out some of these for you. Um, these are inter internal exit polls from the New York Times uh, from the 2008 election. Um, and I, I will just say to you, for example, that um, what is uh, important, I think, about this is that Obama uh, defeated McCain with women by a 13% margin. The question for Mitt Romney is, um, and it would have been better perhaps if, the, if we can get a woman voter for Romney here too, right? Because that's really who Romney is looking for, right? Uh, he's going to win men, um, more than likely. The question is, by what margin and by what margin will he uh, trail Obama, who's likely, more than likely uh, than not to win uh, among women? What is that victory or that vote margin going to look like? Is it going to be 13%? Is it going to be 20%? Is it going to be 4%? What are we looking at? Women in 2004 decided the presidential election. It wasn't gay marriage initiatives in Ohio. It was women feeling that George W. Bush was a stronger leader than John Kerry. End of story. We could talk about why in 9-11 and what the former governor, Tom Ridge, of this state said about um, uh, you know, the, uh, the use of uh, co the color coding system. Uh, Women felt that the country need, was going to be, needed to be in strong hands, and they viewed Bush as a strong, decisive leader. Uh, and they did not view John Kerry in that way. And I think that that's um, important. I think to, so the women vote is, the women's vote, I think, is, is uh, certainly critical here. Um, I think also, if you're looking at um, this, these kind of internals, People get excited, and there are lots of stories about 18 to 29-year-olds, and are they going to turn out for Obama in the same way they did in 2008? I'll just um, caution all of us about that, and I certainly don't want students um, not to vote. That's you know, not my goal. But um, in 2004, uh, that demographic, 18 to 29-year-olds, made up something like 16% of the electorate. And in 2008, it made up 17% of the electorate. Um, as my grandmother would say, hoo hoo. I mean, uh, <laughs> rest in peace, right? Uh, you know, that really doesn't do much for you. I mean, it may have helped Obama in places like North Carolina, certainly Indiana, maybe some college kids tipped them, but it's not enough to, uh, had, had, had it been 16% as it was in 2004, he still would be president today. And if it goes back to 16%, uh, I don't think in and of itself that will decide the election. Could it? It could. I'm, but we're talking brass tacks here. I don't really think that that in and of itself. It's going to be how, in my estimation, it's going to come down to how women feel about the um, growth of the economy and whether or not Mitt Romney can find a way to pull off some Latino votes. Uh, general election progression, uh, 
stats I've mentioned to you, it's about a two point lead right now in the poll of polls. And you can see, it's, we're looking at a tight, elect, uh, a tight popular vote race, perhaps. I think that's probably right. But that doesn't always translate into a tight race in the electoral college. This is, I think, interesting, the direction of the country. Uh, for years, political scientists have been enamored with the right track, wrong track um, statistics or variable. Is the country on the right, headed in the right direction or the wrong direction? If you look at um, 2011, though, from 2011 to 2012, one way to read this is to say people are feeling better about the growth of, or the direction of the country, that it's improved from 2011 to the present, right? You see how it dips down and then starts to ascend and how um, the wrong track numbers descend. These are god-awful numbers. But what we've learned is that, what's it, this is May 18th. In November, as Americans, we know this month will not exist in our memory. This month did not happen as far as we're concerned as Americans, right? Because it will be, we will only remember life in America from Labor Day forward. None of this will have happened, and this is the Etch-a-Sketch comment that Mitt Romney's uh, uh, manager made, right? What he was referring to is not even so much the campaign, but the American voter. Historically, voters vote based upon what the economy is doing in the summer or early fall of the general election. And their attitude about the economy and the economic growth of the country in the late summer or early fall of a presidential election. It's not even the raw number per se. I mean, you can look at it, you know, Reagan was reelected, I think, with a 7.2% unemployment, but it had gotten so much better than the 10% or whatever it was beforehand. Will voters, you know, uh, tie Obama to the awful unemployment rate? Will they feel that things are getting better? That becomes uh, the key thing, I think, with regard to this kind of uh, number. Interactive, we won't do that. This is what the Obama campaign administration wants you to think about him. This is him announcing to the country, walking out on that red carpet to announce to the country the killing of Osama bin Laden, strong, decisive leader, presidential. You don't want to turn this over to someone else, right? The thing about campaigning against an incumbent is that we already know who they are, right? I mean, sometimes it's a bad thing, maybe, if you're Jimmy Carter, right? Um, but Obama's also been, dare I say, lucky. Um, there's actually a sordid story I could tell you now, but, uh, you know, they would never let me talk again. No, I am, I'm, a very, I'm a professional. I would never go there. But, uh, this is, I'm a very straight-laced person, as my students will tell you. I wouldn't dare insult uh, this august body. Um, having said that, it was a pretty off-the-hook kind of story about how he got to become senator, right, because of... Uh, the person who was in the Senate at the time had to leave, and there was a vacancy, and he left for all kinds of illicit reasons. Obama's been lucky. He gets Bin Laden, those helicopter helicopter goes down, right? Can you imagine if the helicopter goes down and those guys get killed? Where, God forbid, right? But you know, from a, just a pure political standpoint, what that would have done, right? He's been very lucky, blessed, whatever you, term you want to use, been fortunate. This is the image they want. It's hard to get that image out of the people's minds with regard to an incumbent. If things are going relatively well, it's hard to unseat an incumbent because we kind of know who they are. We've lived with them for three or four years as, as a citizen body. Americans, many Americans on the left were astounded that George W. Bush was reelected in 2004. Uh, how is that possible? The war in Iraq was going to hell. I saw Fahrenheit 9-11. This should be over, right? They made that movie. All those people getting killed, 9-11, no weapons a mess. How did he get reelected? People liked them. I, I apologize for the, on the behalf of the American people that we still elect people oftentimes because we like them um, uh, rather than, you know, uh, for more uh, substantial reasons. But a good reason, a good reason Bush was reelected was because people felt a certain security in who he was as an individual. They didn't feel secure about John Kerry out there water surfing or whatever he was doing and his wife with the pashmina, right? We become very, uh, he was easy to otherize. Um, Obama's, it's hard to put the turban on him now and say this black guy is born in, you know, uh, Kenya and, um, you know, his mama's a communist and, you know, it's, just, it's, it's harder now. You could try that in 2008. It's just hard, Th those stories don't resonate. If they resonated at all, they don't resonate nearly as much now. 
I'm very envious of the hair, as you can tell, for obvious reasons. I must say, um, if I could provide a little levity here on a Friday afternoon, I appreciate your staying for this. Uh, who is Mitt Romney? I think that right now, this is the battle um, that the Obama campaign and the Romney campaign is waging in the public mind. What do you think of when you think of Mitt Romney? What, what does the Romney campaign want you to think? They want you to think he's a leader, a businessman, an executive, a former governor. I like governors. I wrote a book about them and, and their influence on the presidency. Um, who is he? What is the image? What is the image that comes to your mind, the first thing you think about uh, when you think about Mitt Romney? It's very important because, uh, to me, he feels a lot like John Kerry. He feels a lot like Al Gore. Um, competent, technocratic, um, hardworking, probably decent individuals who have no real ability to inspire any kind of outward feeling of about anything, anything. I, I don't know, right? Kind of um, emotional ciphers. All due respect to the Romney um, voter in the room, I think it's great that people might actually look at Romney's record and like it, but I'm saying from a, short, a, a pure gut level reaction, there's lots of polling and studies on this. Uh, Zoller, John Zoller has done lots of studies about mass voting, uh, mass feelings and, and sentiment and public opinion. Um, people vote based on oftentimes on heuristics. What is the image? What, is, what does this person convey to you, right? And I think that that's still up for grabs. And I think this is an opportunity for Romney to, uh, in the next several months, define himself in ways that I don't think he has, frankly, uh, that are favorable to the American people. And I think that that's one of the reasons why we cannot say for sure that this election uh, is going to be definitively uh, over by any means. Um, but I will say, I will, I go on the, on the record this May 18th and um, risk all of my limited, um, actually non-existent credentials within the Department of Political Science here at Lehigh University and say that it's my humble opinion that I do think Barack Obama will be reelected. I do think he'll probably get upwards of about 290 electoral votes and I won't, I won't be surprised uh, if that were to happen. Uh, so with that, I'll stop now and um, you've been very good. I'll take your questions and um, we can, have some fun with this. I think I promised my Romney friend, where, where did he go? He promised me a vote at the end. Oh, what did you want to vote on, sir? Who's going to win? Oh, OK, we can do that. So how many, how many people agree with me? Peer pressure there. How many people disagree? I think that reflects the national mood. I think that reflects the national, you know, they, they did a poll recently of, um, Republicans, Democrats, independents, who do you think is going to win the election? And it was like 60 something, 60 to 40 that uh, Obama was going to win. What was disconcerting um, for Republicans was that a good number of Republicans didn't feel confident that he would win. I think that's why I say he feels sort of like Kerry to me. So Democrats thought the argument for Kerry in 2004 was that he could beat Bush. We don't really like him. He's not Howard Dean, doesn't excite us. It's kind of bland. Eh. You know, it's a kind of, you know, but he could beat Bush, and we're excited about that because we saw Fahrenheit 9 11, the, no weapons of mass destruction, the death and the murder in Iraq, and it's all the hell. Kerry, he was a military guy, they'll never be able to touch him on that because he served and Bush didn't, right? So let's go for him. How'd that work out? Um, so I think that's part of the dynamic there. Um, was there a hand here? Yes. I think, um, yes, but I think the way to work on it is by being sincere. Yeah, I remember, and what I mean, and I'm not faulting him, I think, you know, all of these individuals are so managed, right? Um, you know, Al Gore went through his uh, earth tones phase, he went through his primary colors, they had him dressed in all kinds, what, you know, they, they poll tested what makes you like Al Gore, and they found out we really don't know what the answer to that is. Um, right? I think that sometimes you can get caught up in trying to be likable and lack any kind of consistency in terms of your presentation to voters, your campaign ads, and your strategy sort of reflects that. Mitt Romney, 
needs to be himself. He's been a very successful politician, a very successful individual in American life. He needs to speak like a, a perfect example. He, um, the speech the other day uh, at Liberty University, um, you can say the word Mormon. Say it. It didn't appear in this speech. Say it. You're a Mormon. I mean, it's like a pretty big deal about you, you know? Um, and um, I, I don't know, I think that, um, I think that's, that'd be a healthy thing for him. Um, you know, he's tended to shy away from his experiences as governor of Massachusetts because of the health care record there. You know, it's, you know, tough for some, you know, uh, on the right uh, to digest. But I think Romney's got to just be himself. I think once you start to manage, I mean, this image here, um, it's difficult uh, to maintain this uh, without it turning into caricature because at some point, you know, they, they, well, which way should we put the collar, right? Uh, you know, what kind of jeans should you wear? And, you know, get your wife here. And I think you can overmanage presentation. And I think that's what happened to Gore. I think it's what happened to Kerry. And I think it's uh, a challenge for Romney. He just needs to be himself and be strong in who he is. And I, frankly, um, to put it mildly, I think that he's done quite the opposite rhetorically. He's tended to shift on some questions of policy and rather than embrace certain elements of his record, I think he should embrace who he is. A perfect example of this is that George W. Bush. Personally, I'm not, uh, he's not, you know, in my office, you know, next to Lincoln, right? Um, but, uh, but what George, no, well, you know, but George W. Bush understood politics on a base, basic human level. And he understood how to be comfortable being himself. I don't think um, he was putting on airs, maybe 20, 30 years ago when he was first wearing those boots in Texas, right? Um, uh, and going against sort of what his father was doing in Texas uh, with the whole Connecticut background thing. Uh, maybe then he was trying it on for size, but I think George W. Bush has been himself and he remains who he is now. I don't think there's anything about him that is necessarily superficial uh, other than whatever comes normally for, you know, politicians, which, you know, it's a pretty big asterisk, I suppose. But I, I think that Romney's got to find what that means for him. Yes, sir? Do you, do you think that Mitt can turn around with a stellar vice presidential candidate? That's part one of the question. Part two would be, so what the profile of that candidate have? Um, I, think, um, I think the answer is no. Let me tell you why. Because I remember Lloyd Benson. You remember Lloyd Benson, 1988? Oh my God, his silver hair, you know, rugged guy, gentlemanly, court, courtly appearance. Um, he was going to make Michael Dukakis sexy. And you're right now thinking to yourself, that is like humanly impossible. <laughs> but uh, Lloyd Benson, he was phenomenal in the debates, right? He, you know, he told uh, Dan Quayle, Senator, I knew Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. And the nation applauded and, oh, he was so magnificent and not a single American went to the poll thinking, you know what, that Lloyd Benson's gonna make a hell of a VP. I, we just don't vote like that. We don't vote for vice president. There've been some wonderful vice presidential nominees and some god awful ones. Um, Dan Quayle was, I think, a god awful one. All due respect, I think he had some, uh, he, he was better than some others I could name. But, I, I, you know, George Herbert Walker Bush didn't need Dan Quayle to be spectacular. He just needed him to pass the competency test. What I think Romney should do, um, and you ought not to have to spell this out, and I think his campaign is going to great strains and pains to make this a point right now, but he should choose someone that he believes can be president if, God forbid, something happened to him. That's the first rule. Uh, and then after that, look at what George W. Bush did in choosing Cheney, right? He chose someone who was actually living in Texas at the time. Cheney had to move to Wyoming, right, to, just to constitutionally qualify to be president. Because the whole geography thing is out the window. I don't think Obama was worrying about Delaware. Choose someone who's competent, who's strong, who you can get along with. I'm, I'm reading the Robert Caro book now. I don't know if any of you, I shouldn't talk, authors should never talk about other authors. It's a hell of a book, right? The Caro book on the Johnson years, right? You should buy my book, How Governors Built the Modern American Presidency. It's like only $55. And if you, if you go to uh, like um, the UK, it's 36 pounds, which is less than 55. So, but I'm reading the Caro book 
It is. It's 36 is less than 55. I, I, took, I, I know that about economics. Um, but I'm reading the Carroll book, and poor LBJ didn't have, uh, he couldn't, uh, he was like a mouse in, uh, in, in the Kennedy White House, right? I mean, he was a persona non grata. He was non-existent. He was invisible. And that's wrong on so many levels. It's, it's damaging to the country. Uh, it's, hard, it's irresponsible, frankly. And I happen to like Kennedy for a lot of reasons. It's irresponsible to, to choose someone that you have no desire to work with. Uh, maybe Bush worked with Cheney too much. Clinton and Gore had a really good working relationship. I think that you have to choose someone that you are willing to make senior on your team. And I think that should be the number one criteria. Uh, yes, sir? Uh, because in my estimation, it's not a swing state. Uh, the question, yes, sir. Um, the gentleman asked or said he noticed that I didn't mention anything about Pennsylvania as a swing state. And because I, in my opinion, it is not a swing state. Is, um, Pennsylvania is a swing state uh, for Republicans the way Arizona is a swing state for Democrats this year. Could you cobble together in your mind enough Latino votes that would come out of Arizona? And maybe there have been some polls that showed up. I think Obama or the Democrats could win um, Arizona in 2016. Could he win it now? I guess if, if a miracle of miracles, it, I, I don't think it's so. And I think Pennsylvania is actually less of a swing state than Arizona might be. It's just there are too many folks in Philadelphia um, that hold the tide, uh, that hold the, the, the keys to the kingdom, if you will, in a presidential election. Just too many, too many folks who are just died in the world Democrats and turn out and so forth. Um, so no. They'll come here, right? And there'll be some talks probably at Lehigh. Some candidates will come. But I, I just don't I think it's a waste of resources. If I'm a Republican, I'm not spending a lot of time and money in Pennsylvania. I'm just not. Yes, sir? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, let, me get, let me get this gentleman first. Go ahead. In the beginning, you said that it's really all about the economy. I think that's true. I mean, the stock market the last two weeks has really, really uh, taken a pretty uh, big hit. And Europe is, is a basket case. I mean, so it really all depends on November, October, and the sign what what's really going to happen in the economy. So I think that. Gay marriage and all that kind of stuff will fade away. So I, I really think it's really going to depend upon the economy and that. Do you think that's true? I do. I do. But the problem with that is that it, that's not good. Um, that's not good copy. You know, if you got to run a morning television show, um, how many days can you wake up and say, well, what are the job numbers? You know, um, it's much uh, more thrilling to talk about race or gender or sexuality or some of these other things. And people say ridiculous things and people do ridiculous things in America, right? Because there's 300 million of us and, you know, odds are there's some psycho somewhere is going to say or do something, right? Um, but that's why I sort of started with the Billy Bean commentary. Don't watch the, you can't watch your players. You can't watch the game. To a, you'll become more ignorant. Distance yourself a little bit and start to think in terms of what are the trends? What does history tell us? What are the numbers? The numbers tell us it's about jobs, right? Um, the story after 2004 was that these gay marriage initiatives uh, in places like Ohio doomed John Kerry. And there's just really no, you know, there are political scientists much better than I am, like Mo Fiorina at Stanford and others who have really looked carefully at this. And there's just absolutely no correlation. Um, so yeah, I do think it comes down to jobs, the state, how people feel about the economy. Well, Europe is going to really get about that time. No, it, it, it could be, and I, so I think you know, there, who knows, Iran, there, all kinds of variables. Greece, yes, I agree. And sir, yes, you've been patient. You say that Romney is charismatic or not charismatic? Wow, I've done a bad job. I, I, <laughs> I think I'm saying he's not, I, 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 I don't think I'll, I, you would apply the term charisma to Mitt Romney. Was George Herbert, here's what you gotta think about though, if you're Mitt Romney, was George Herbert Walker Bush charismatic? No, he won though, right? Uh, he didn't defeat an incumbent though, did he? Um, you know, it takes, I mean, if you're gonna, if we're talking on the corner here, you know, it takes something pretty strong to knock off a sitting president, you know? You know, Bill Clinton had some hustle, but he had some help, right? He had, you know, Clinton was a magnificent politician, whatever you think about him, an all-world, once-in-a-century kind of ability to connect with people. 
You take Ross Perot that race, I don't know what the hell happens there. Um, and then you start to look around at people who, you know, Reagan, um, you know, an unbelievably effective communicator who had a considerable weight in terms of ideological commitment and experience in politics and a team uh, and a kind of moment of conservatism that he was representing. Um, did Mitt Romney have any of that? I mean, I'm, let's just, dare I say, keep it real. Um, does Mitt Romney have any of those kinds of qualities? He's going to have, if he's to win, he's going to have to win in a kind of um, traditional, gut it out, you know, get out the vote, brass tacks kind of way. And that's just very difficult when you're trying to unseat a sitting president. Was Jimmy Carter charismatic? No, he had a great smile, but Gerald Ford had not much time uh, as an incumbent, right? So you start to go back and think, you know, who is Romney like? You know, it usually takes a dynamic individual. He's a governor and that helps. Um, you have the only person to defeat a sitting president um, over the last 100 and some odd years is a governor. Uh, senators don't do it. Um, the last person who wasn't a governor to do it was Benjamin Harrison, uh, who defeated my beloved Grover Cleveland, which I remember staying up late night for the poll. It was just like awful. And then Ted Koppel came on and told me that Cleveland had lost. And uh, you know, and I, you know, I like big men like that. You know, Cleveland was a big guy, and I liked, I could relate, and I felt good about it. But no. So he's got the governor's thing. Have I mentioned I've written a book on governors who've become president and all? Um, it's only like $55, 36 pounds in, in the UK. Yes, sir. Um, I have in my notes, foreign policy, area least likely to change. Um, you know, why does this election matter, right? You know, the future of healthcare, the future of uh, the economy, tax policy. Um, some of these social issues will, you know, um, either continue on a certain trajectory or not, depending on who's president. I, I was in Florida, I don't know, a couple of years ago, and I met, had the privilege of meeting John Meacham, the former managing editor of Newsweek. And we were talking about politics, and he said, man, you know, I, I don't think the Democratic and Republican Party, there's, I don't think, I think like the old saying goes, there's not a dime's worth of difference between the Democratic and Republican Party. And on a certain level, I understand that, the use of money and all of this. But I do seriously disagree um, uh, with, the, with the premise that says um, a Romney presidency or an Obama presidency, six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. No, it, it will matter quite a bit in terms of policy. Uh, and uh, the only area where I think there is likely to be some serious continuity is in foreign policy. Now, that probably upsets some people on the left who really like Obama because some of the policies, you know, whether it's um, you know, uh, bombing in tribal areas from you know, the drones or some of the rendition policies they're not going to be um, you know, thrilled with. Um, it's been a pretty aggressive uh, foreign policy, despite what some on the right might think about Obama. Uh, it's been a pretty, um, pretty, you know, pretty heavy-handed um, military policy, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, I don't think that that's going to change under Romney, and I don't think Romney, if you've listened carefully, he doesn't have much to say critical about Obama other than that he apologizes for America, right? Like when we kill a lot of people, we say, well, man, I'm sorry, you know, like, you know, which Romney will do too, you know? So I think foreign policy, there will be some stability and some continuity. This gentleman and then over here. What are your ideas on the uh, position of the House? I think Democrats will keep the Senate. I think Republicans will keep the House. Maybe a little. I think Democrats will peel off some of the House. Could they take the House? Here's how. If um, we're looking at those 200,000s of jobs, like, you know, let's say we come out of May and June, and all of a sudden the so called recovery summer that was supposed to happen last summer. You know, uh, maybe there's some weather-related issues to the lack of growth over the last few months, and you hear different kinds of economists talk about that. Let's just say for the sake of argument that all of a sudden we look up and we say, wow, this economy is all of a sudden kicked in. These job numbers are going great. And then I think, yeah, it's, theoretically it's possible, unlikely, for the Democrats to retake the House. But shorten the margins, yeah, they could. And I think they'll keep the, the Senate, which means all of that said, I think it means just greater gridlock, <laughs> or the continuation of uh, politics as normal, as usual. There was a hand. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I heard uh, someone talk about two months ago exactly what the theme that you presented, which was difficult to be in the In this particular political assignment, which we examined and analyzed very carefully, Pete Carter and Reagan, uh, 
Yes. I think the debates, those deb oh, I think though it's a great question. I think those debates helped Reagan immensely. Look, I mean, you know, liberals basically thought Reagan drooled on himself and knew nothing about anything, right? He was an actor, right? You know, bedtime for Bonzo. Um, there was a famous story of Reagan debating Bobby Kennedy, and I guess it was, I don't know, 67. And Kennedy thought it was going to be a cakewalk. And he came out of that debate with Reagan, and he looked at his staff and said, OK, which one of you sons of bitches set me up? Um, Reagan was, I'm not saying he was brilliant. He wasn't. Uh, and as a conservative ideological thinker, he wasn't a Bill Buckley, if you like that kind of thinking. Uh, he wasn't as a sophisticated, architectonic thinker. But he was much smarter and knew his positions better and knew the opposition positions better and can present his argument in ways that gave the American people confidence that he could be president. I think that was the litmus test for the American people. Jeez, Carter, come on, right? These helicopters going down, the economy, and you know everything with you know, Iran. But there was some fear about Reagan, because Reagan had uh, a very, very right kind of career and um, presentation to the public. Um, Reagan had to demonstrate that he could be presidential. Those debates, I think, really turned the tide for Reagan. Uh, and so um, that's not Romney's problem. I don't think people wake up thinking, geez, Mitt Romney, oh, he can never be president. No, that's Sarah Palin. That's, he's not that. People don't have that fear about Mitt Romney. They you know, think he could, he'd be a good president and, you know, in terms of he'd show up for the job, he'd do a good job. You know? he'd, he'd fill in the holes. He'd do a good job. The question is, do they believe he's a leader? I think that's the, do they believe he's had the positions of leadership? Can he convey to people that he's truly a leader, that he has some consistent thought, that he has, um, that that image that you're looking at is not just a guy with the collar pulled up, but that there's something under there. That's what Gore couldn't convince people of. That's what, in my estimation, Kerry couldn't convince people of. These are all people with very stellar careers, right? Um, but we don't typically... Um, you know, if we're voting on the best man, I, you know, I don't know, George Herbert Walker Bush, I don't know how many people he saved and uh, when he survived in uh, World War II, he was shot down, he was in the, you know, in the water. I mean, you know, Bill Clinton was hanging out in Oxford. You know, I like Oxford too, you know. But if the, from a record standpoint, there's no comparison, but that's not enough. I didn't tell you the end. This guy predicted exactly the contrary to what you're saying. He, he thinks that uh, he thought. Wow. Well, you know, there you go. There you go. Um, I, if, if I could get into the spirit of Mitt Romney, $10,000 bet. <laughs> um, thank you, guys. You've been a wonderful audience. I appreciate it. Thank you.